But regardless of what they would have preferred, the Earps were fast approaching the gunfight that would make them famous. Virgil was city marshal, Morgan was a special policeman for six weeks or two months, wore a badge and drew pay. I had been sworn in Virgil's place to act for him while Virgil was gone to Tucson for a trial. Virgil had been back several days, but I was still acting and I knew it was Virgil's duty to disarm those men. I expected he would have trouble in doing so and I followed up to give assistance if necessary. About 10 minutes afterwards, and while Virgil, Morgan, Doc Holliday, and myself were standing in the center of 4th and Allen Streets, several persons said, There is going to be trouble with those fellows. And one man named Coleman said to Virgil Earp, They mean trouble. They have just gone from Dunbar's Corral into the OK Corral all armed. I think you'd better go and disarm them. Virgil turned around to Doc Holliday, Morgan, and myself and told us to come and assist him in disarming them. But first, Virgil called to Sheriff Johnny Behan for assistance in disarming the cowboys. Behan said that if Virgil was with him, it would turn into a fight, but that he would go alone to see if he could disarm them. I told him that was all I wanted them to do, to lay off their arms while they were in town. Shortly after he left, I was notified that they were on Fremont Street, and I called on Wyatt and Morgan Earp and Doc Holliday to go help me disarm the Clansons and McLowrys. We started down 4th Street to Fremont, turned down Fremont West towards Fly's Lodging House. When we got about somewhere by Bower's Butcher Shop, I saw the parties before we got there, in a vacant lot between the photograph gallery and the house west of it. The parties were Ike and Billy Clanton, Tom and Frank McLowry, Johnny Behan. Johnny Behan seen myself and party coming towards them. He left the Clanton and McLowry party and came on a fast walk towards us, and once in a while he would look behind at the party he left, as though expecting danger of some kind. He met us somewhere close to the butcher shop. He threw up both hands and said, For God's sake, don't go there, or they will murder you. I said, Johnny, I am going down to disarm them. By this time, I had passed him a step and heard him say, I have disarmed them all. When he said that, I had a walking stick in my left hand, and my right hand was on my six-shooter. And when he said he had disarmed them, I shoved it clean around my left hip and changed my walking stick to my right hand. Like his brother, Wyatt also relaxed a bit when he heard that Johnny Bean had reported that he had disarmed the Clantons and McClory's already. When he said this, I took my pistol, which I had in my hand under my coat, and put it in my overcoat pocket. Behan then passed up the street, and we walked on down. The Tombstone Nugget, one of the local papers, reported what happened next. October 27, 1881. When within a few feet of them, the marshal said to the Clantons and McLowrys, throw up your hands, boys, I intend to disarm you. As he spoke, Frank McLowry made a motion to draw his revolver when Wyatt Earp pulled his and shot him, the ball striking on the right side of his abdomen. About the same time, Doc Holliday shot Tom McLowry in the right side using a short shotgun, such as is carried by Wells Fargo and company's messengers. In the meantime, Billy Clanton had shot at Morgan Earp, the ball passing through the point of the left shoulder blade across his back, just grazing the backbone and coming out at the shoulder, the ball remaining inside of his shirt. He fell to the ground, but in an instant gathered himself and raising in a sitting position, fired at Frank McLowry as he crossed Fremont Street and at the same instant, Doc Holliday shot at him, both balls taking effect, either of which would have proved fatal, as one struck him in the right temple and the other in the left breast. While this was going on, Billy Clanton had shot Virgil Earp in the right leg, the ball passing through the calf, inflicting a severe flesh wound. In turn, he had been shot by Morgan Earp in the right side of the abdomen and twice by Virgil Earp once in the right wrist and once in the left breast. 
Soon after the shooting commenced, Ike Clanton ran through the O.K. Corral, across Allen Street, into Kellogg's Saloon, and thence through Toughnut Street, where he was arrested and taken to the county jail. The firing altogether didn't occupy more than 25 seconds, during which time fully 30 shots were fired. According to R.F. Coleman, a witness to the event, immediately after the firing, Sheriff Bean tried to arrest the Earps. Wyatt replied, I won't be arrested today. I'm right here and I'm not going away. You have deceived me. You told me these men were disarmed. I went to disarm them. Tom and Frank McClory and Billy Clanton all died from their wounds. Virgil and Morgan recovered, but they, Wyatt and Doc Holliday, stood trial for murder. In the trial, there were varying reports regarding whether Ike Clanton and Tom McClory were armed, though even the Cowboy supporters did not dispute that Frank McClory and Billy Clanton carried guns. Morgan's and Virgil's wounds made that clear. There was also debate over who shot first, with some saying it was Frank, others saying it was Morgan or Doc. In the end, Judge Wells Spice, a friend of Wyatt's, ruled that the evidence indicated that the Earps and Doc Holliday had acted within the law. But in the eyes of the Cowboys and their friends, and there were many in and around Tombstone, the Earps had gotten away with murder. This would not be the end. December 28th, 1881, two months after the gunfight. Arizona Weekly Citizen, January 1, 1882. As Deputy United States Marshal, Virgil Earp was crossing Fifth Street, <laughs> an attempt was made to assassinate him. Five shots were fired in rapid succession from shotguns loaded with buckshot. It is thought three men did the shooting. They were concealed in a vacant building the opposite side of Allen Street. Immediately after having fired, they ran through the rear of the building and disappeared in the darkness. Earp was wounded in the left arm, just above the elbow, fracturing the bone. He also received a shot above the groin, the shot coming out near the spine. The wounds are very dangerous, probably mortal. Fortunately, Virgil did survive those wounds, though he never regained use of his left arm. Wyatt quickly telegraphed the U.S. Marshal in Phoenix, Crawley Dake, to tell him what had happened. Dake was the Marshal who had deputized Virgil years earlier. Dake responded by appointing Wyatt Deputy U.S. Marshal, with the power to appoint his own deputies as well. Wyatt formed a posse, which included Morgan, their younger brother, Warren Earp, Doc Holliday, and a collection of tough men with colorful names. Jack, Turkey Creek Johnson, Texas Jack Vermilion, Tip Tipton, and Harelip Charlie Smith. Also deputized by Wyatt was Sherman McMaster, a former Texas Ranger and also a former compatriot of the Cowboys. The posse was able to eventually track down Ike Clanton and his brother Phineas, called Finn, who were believed to be involved in the assassination attempt on Virgil. The charges were dismissed for insufficient evidence, and Wyatt later claimed that the judge told him, Wyatt, you'll never clean up this crowd this way. Next time, you'd better leave your prisoners in the brush, where alibis don't count. Not long after, Morgan Earp was shot in the back, killed while shooting pool. A coroner's inquest identified the prime suspects as Frank Stilwell, Johnny Behan's former deputy, and four other men. 
Wyatt likely had the judge's advice in mind as he took his next actions. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.